So uh, about five months ago, uh, five or six months ago, we started this series uh, just after the new year called Apprentices of Jesus. And like Lair said, uh, today it comes to an end. Um, and what comes to an end is just the series, not the idea of becoming apprentices. You feel free to do that, you know, continue to do that forever. Um, but the series ends today. And we started uh, about six or so months ago by talking about uh, the Great Commission. Jesus gathered his 11 disciples together, and he told them to go and make disciples. And one of the questions that we asked was, what on earth is a disciple? And what I said is that a disciple is, is not so much a student uh, in knowledge only, but it's much, better described, it's much better described as an apprentice. An apprentice is somebody who's looking looking at someone, looking at a master, and trying to become like that master. That is an apprentice. Um, I tried to go to great pains. Uh, I tried to go to really great pains to describe the idea that uh, we, this is not what, I'm not, what I'm talking about is not works, righteousness. It's not that you're saved by what you do. But instead, a much better vision of Christianity is that Jesus died to offer you salvation. And that in salvation, you're actually free. You're completely free to see the beauty, uh, the glory, the truth, the goodness of who Jesus is, and to actually want to become more like him because he's unbelievably awesome. Um, if you remember in there, I had a sermon about Gad. Does anybody remember the sermon about Gad with all the pictures? Um, it's probably the sermon of all the ones I've ever shared that most people followed up and talked to me about uh, and what I tried to share in that sermon is that a lot of times what we do is we try to change by our willpower alone. And so if you remember Gad, he had a, a wife, Juanita, who was annoyed because he had an anger issue. And uh, he tried to change just by his own sheer efforts, and it didn't work. It wouldn't last. And we said that instead of changing by our own efforts, the better Christian view or the biblical view is that the way we change is by doing practices that allow the Holy Spirit to come into and to change our hearts from the inside out. And that actually what happens is we, ch we change on the inside and then kind of in fits and starts, that change eventually works its way to our outside actions. Um, what's interesting about that is that if we change that kind of way, we see the, the beauty of becoming Christ-like for, for its own sake. In other words, we don't try to become like Jesus to manipulate or manage other people. We don't try to do it to impress other people. Wow, they're going to check me out and I'm the best Christian. That kind of, that, that's nothing to do with it. We become more like Jesus because that's actually the best and, and, and the most beautiful way to live a life. And Jesus showed us that. After kind of setting the stage with those sermons, uh, basically week after week after week, we looked at Jesus and we looked at something he did or the way he lived in a particular area of his life. And then we tried to talk about how we could also do that sort of thing. And so we started with um, Jesus' practice of going alone into solitude and silence by himself. Uh, then we looked at Jesus and joy. Uh, not Pastor Chris's wife, but Jesus and the concept. <laughs> There's like three people that laughed. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> the concept of I'm talking, Chris's wife is joy, if you didn't. Her, that's her name. Um, whatever. We saw that Jesus asked a lot of questions, uh, 338 questions to be exact. And that he invites us to also care for and love other people, not by just telling them things, but by asking them the questions and listening to their responses. Uh, Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man, and so it's very important for us as followers of Jesus to stop and rest, to let him be in control, to take one day a week and do nothing. That God wants that for you because the gospel says that you can't earn, you can't manage, you can't produce enough goodness on your own. You have to just trust that he has goodness for you. Uh, Jesus' death on the cross is an invitation for us to die to self. And so I tried to explain the, the idea that the healthiest way to live is, a life, is to lead a life where you are daily taking up your cross and saying, I'm willing to let go of my own desires for the good of other people. And that's actually the most fulfilling way to live your life. Jesus loves the Bible because it's a collection of books that's all about him, that it all tells one cohesive story that is the story of the gospel, the story that we can't earn our goodness, but that God showed us his goodness in Christ. 
Uh, we had two sermons on prayer. Uh, one was prayer to a good father, that we don't have a consumer relationship with God, that we do a certain thing and then he you know, has to answer and respond to us in a, in a certain way. Um, and then the second, prayer, the second prayer sermon was on apprentices' prayer. So we usually call it the Lord's Prayer, but this is the idea that uh, when folks said to Jesus, how should we pray? He said, here's how to pray. And he gave us a framework that we can use as kind of a guide. Uh, and I know for me, I've been using this for quite a while, but even since that prayer, I've been using that a lot as I think through what is it like to pray to God. Last week, uh, Ing and I were away, and if you were here, Drex talked about uh, platonic intimate physical touch. And I've heard from a lot of people as they give me a hug or whatever uh, recently that they, that sermon was very, very helpful for them in thinking about how Jesus didn't just say words to people, but he engaged in, it, in a human body with them in a loving way uh, through, through physical touch. And so that whole thing <laughs> brings us to today. And what it brings us to is kind of a, a summary in, in a sense of this whole sermon series. And if I were asked how would I summarize this whole series? Here's, here's what I would say. I would say that Jesus is freakishly impressive. He is unbelievably impress- impressive more than we can even imagine. He's so impressive that what he did is he sacrificed his life to offer salvation for us, to free us of our sin debt and, and welcome us into a new life with him. But it does, doesn't just end there. It's actually like, oh, wow, and he also lived an awesome life as as a person, and the more that we emulate his life, the healthier our lives become, the more impact we have, and the more we feel as if we're we're living the kind of life that we ought to have lived. And so I think that Jesus' vision of apprenticeship is that he wants to have the most amount of apprentices of Jesus— And he wants all of those apprentices to be as much like the master as possible. In other words, heaven is going to be basically the world where everyone is as much like Jesus as they possibly can be. And so why wouldn't we start that now and include as many people as we possibly can into that situation? All right, with that being said, uh, what I want to do uh, with the passage for today is I want to relook. Kind of this is the capstone, the end of this sermon series. I want to relook at the exact same passage we started it all with uh, that Larry read just a minute ago, the Great Commission. Um, it's always fascinating to me that Jesus said these words to 11 guys. Uh, Judas was gone. Peter was probably in his 20s. Most folks think the other 10 disciples were teenage guys. Right? So imagine, like, this is not 200 people. Imagine, you know, one guy in his 20s and 10 teenage guys, and here's how Jesus is going to kind of change the world by starting the mission of his church on earth, and he's going to talk to those 11 guys. And this is what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make apprentices. I know it says disciples, but just think this through. Go therefore and make apprentices of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'm quite curious how five months later (laughs) that passage strikes you. Right, like kind of, with all, you know, and some people I know haven't been with us the whole time or whatever, but with the information that we've been sharing week after week after week after week of apprentices of Jesus, how does that strike you now to hear, go therefore and make apprentices of all nations? I think in Jesus's mind, he really wanted to do two things here. He wanted to encourage his followers to both make more apprentices and to take those people who were apprentices, who were followers or disciples or whatever word you want to choose there, and have them become more like their master. I think he wanted both things to happen. Here's how I I can see that. The main verb in this passage is the idea of making apprentices, but it follows with two things after that. The first one is baptizing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Baptism is, is the step that people take to publicly announce that they are a new apprentice of Jesus. It's relatively simple. It's kind of like um, we're going to have baptism in July 10th. And I got people, and I'm having this conversation with them. They want to get baptized. Okay, here's what it's all about, that kind of thing. It's a public proclamation that you can count me in on the team or the family or the group of apprentices of Jesus. That's basically what baptism is. And so Jesus says very clearly that we want to make more apprentices. And we want to baptize more people. Now, if you've been with us for a while, I get pretty fired up about this. The Mifflin County has something 46, 44, 46,000 people in it. Of them, a pretty accurate guesstimate of how many of them go to church or are engaged at some level within a church community as apprentices of Jesus is maybe 14 to 16,000 people. Here's what that means. There are 30,000 people carrying the image of God in their, in their, their selves who are not yet apprentices of Jesus. So when, G, when, when Jesus says here, go and make apprentices, I think what he means is go to those people and try to, try to work to get them to become apprentices of Jesus because it's the best way, it's the best way to live. But there's another part of growing as apprentices that, that's not just about the new people. It's about anybody who already is committed to Jesus to also be growing themselves. I'm convinced, let me say it as clearly as I can, there's a giant challenge where Christians are failing morally. And you, you see it most commonly in, in pastors morally failing, but you also see it when you look at the, the, the divorce rates and all the different things amongst Christians. You say, wait a second, I thought they were supposed to be different, but they're not. I would argue that Jesus here in this, is, he's saying two things. He's saying we want more apprentices, but we want anybody who's already on, in the family of God, on the team of Jesus, to grow in their faith. How do we know that? Because the second sentence literally says, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded you, right? All that Jesus had commanded you. And what's interesting in that is it doesn't say teaching them all that Jesus commanded. Like, all you have to do is know the information. It says teaching them to observe. In other words, their lives ought to reflect better what Jesus said over years of apprenticeship to Jesus. And I'm pretty convinced that churches generally focus on only one or the other of those things. So some places say, we want everybody to become Christians, and we, we forget about the part that says teaching the ones who become Christians to observe all. Other places say, well, we're just going to work on ourselves right now, and eventually we'll get to reaching out, but we'll just do that when we're better. And they say, I'm going to work on ourselves. But the, the problem is Jesus says both things together. He wants both of those things to happen simultaneously, and I think they have to. They have to happen at the same time because you're not going to grow as a person unless you also are growing and reaching out to other people because that's how you, how you grow is by caring about others. It all has to fit together. <clears throat> all right. That's, that was my exciting spiel, number one for today. I, I think there's two more coming maybe. Um, here's what I want to do. Um, what I want to do for the rest of the sermon time today is I want to talk uh, as practically as I can about this church. So I want to kind of come down from 30,000 feet and say, what does it look like for Kish as a community of people, right? We, we are the church here, so kind of like those original 11 guys, Jesus is still saying to us, go and make apprentices, right? More and bigger. How does that work for us here? That's the question. And I want to start by sharing uh, some challenges, some, some obstacles in front of us, for that mission, and then I want to share some opportunities that we have that are going to help us in, in achieving that mission. So we got challenges, and we got opportunities, and then we'll kind of pull it all together at the end, hopefully. All right, challenges. Um, challenge number one is that we need to grow in relationships. We need to grow in relationships. Um, I'm well aware that of the two to 300 people, however many people are connected to Kish, that every one of them can't and, and doesn't need to know each other intimately. But I'm also equally convinced that none of us are going to grow apart from actual relationships with other followers of Jesus. 
I think there's a myth that says as long as I come to church and sit and listen to Luke and the worship team and leave, then God can, can, can help me to grow. But I don't think that real growth happens apart from a community of people and relationships with other Christians. Now, we have this interesting dynamic here over the past three years that there's a lot of folks who have been around Kish for years and years and years. There's also a, a decent amount of newer folks who have shown up relatively recently. And how to integrate those two types and groups of people is a high, high priority in my brain. I think that, let me say it this way. If our worship services were much worse than they are, but people were relationally connected and supporting and loving and caring for each other considerably more than they are now, I would be very happy. I think relationships amongst believers are super crucial, but, but there's a catch here, and, and you probably feel or notice this catch in any kind of relational group you're part of, whether it be work or your family or whatever. There's one part of it that says, I want to work on growing my relationship with these people more deeply. But then there's another part that says, how are we reaching out to care for others? And to go back to my, you know, to Jesus's original commission, he wants us to make more and deeper disciples. And what that means is that we both have to relate to each other more deeply, while at the same time, not kind of circling our wagons and focusing in on only us that are here, but also face outward and care about and notice the people that are not yet here or not yet in a relationship with Jesus. And this is a dynamic that I feel very strongly as a pastor, which sort of leads into my second point, my second challenge, which is that I'm only one person. I'm only one person. And so uh, a struggle for me <laughs> is that as people come in on a Sunday or whatever, like a lot of folks, like I relate to a whole bunch of you and a lot of people relate to me well, but I'm only one person. I only have so much time, and I only have so much relational capacity. I also care very deeply about people that are not in this room. And the reason I care very deeply for people that are not in this room is because I think Jesus cares very deeply for people in our community. And so I've recently been meeting with several different neighbors that we got connected to with the soup ministry and this kind of stuff. And it's very challenging to kind of balance how to invest here, and how to invest in other people. But in my mind, it sort of comes back to the Great Commission, which is Jesus says we got to do both. We have to invest in deepening our relationships here while also reaching out to those others. And what I'm trying to do today is invite you to take a further step into that process. If there's 30,000 people in Mifflin County <laughs> that don't yet know about Jesus— there is no way that I can connect. The math just doesn't work. The math is actually, and, and there's a lot of research about this kind of thing, that generally speaking, and if you've been around Kish for a long time, you probably know this is true. Generally speaking, one senior pastor can kind of care for about 200 people. And so the history of Kish is basically that we go a little bit above 200 people, and then it's hard to, 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 to kind of manage all those relationships, and then it dwindles a little less than 200 then a little more than 200, then a little less than 200. That's the history of the, of the rhythm, relatively recent rhythms of this church. And so the question is, how do we break that mold, and I'm thinking a giant vision, to impact way more, you know, 400 people, 600 people, I don't know. But something's got to give there. There's got to be a change in how that dynamic works. That leads me to the third challenge. <clears throat> this one is real simple, actually. Uh, it's the challenge of space. And I'm reading about this stuff and learning about this stuff. I've been a senior pastor for about two years. But one thing uh, that seems very clear from the research that's done about churches is this. A church, it's very rare for a church to grow beyond 80% of the seating capacity on a Sunday service. Now, you, if you know me, please hear my heart in this. I'm not the kind of pastor like... You know, the only way we can tell who's connected to church is who's here every single Sunday. Not, not like that. We got people watching online. That's cool. We got people that come not every Sunday. Like, I'm not worried about that. But what I'm saying is this. <laughs> There's 270 seats in this space. And 80% of that is 216. 
<laughs> and we've been hovering right around the 216 mark. And in my mind, and, and it's not like we haven't been talking about this with the elders and the deacons, that kind of stuff, but in my mind, I just want you to hear my, where my heart is on this. If the Great Commission says there's a lot of people to reach, and post-COVID people are depressed and anxious and, and asking for help, and in need of help and in need of Jesus, how do we reach a number that's, that's considerably more than 230 or whatever the, the number might be? <clears throat> Those are three challenges. I actually have plenty more challenges than that uh, to include things like rising up leaders for some of these ministries, um, how to connect with younger people, which I'm, if you've heard me before, I'm convinced that if the church is going to last far into the future, we're going to have to figure out a way to connect with 20-year-olds. And I'm not convinced that we do that well here. <laughs> There's also this beautiful and interesting problem that um, oftentimes the, the average age of people within a church kind of fits mostly with the age of the senior pastor. And so what happens is you see churches with an old pastor that are generally older, with a younger pastor that are generally younger, and that sort of thing. But I'm convinced that a church is a family. And so <laughs> please, please hear me out. I know that the health of Kish going forward is going to matter by keeping, you know, the oldest folks that are here, like every family needs grandparents and great-grandparents, and a whole bunch of young kids. Like that's a family. It's not one or the other. And so we got to work through all that stuff together. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's challenges. Let's, okay. Um, let me talk about opportunities. Um, opportunity number one is basically this. <laughs> we keep having more people show up. And in so many ways, that's such, such a cool thing. Like, I feel like, to me, it feels like, and I greet people at the door, so I know this. Every Sunday, I'm like introducing myself to new people, and people are bringing other people, and there's really cool things happening with that. And I'm so, so, so excited about that. And if you're here, you might be like, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. More people come. <laughs> also hear that for me, it's like there's more people. So now I have to reach out and connect to and maybe care for and that kind of stuff, more people. Um, we also have a lot of kids around here. And as I've said before other times, I think it's rare these days to see a church with a bunch of young families. And so I talk to a lot of people from other churches, and they say something like, boy, we wish we could just get a few kids at our church. And it's like, what we have here is every single Sunday we're asking for more children's ministry workers. And so there's an opportunity there that is somehow helpful for some people. And so that's a great, great situation. Here's a second opportunity. And I, I haven't talked about this as much, but um, it's really, I want you to hear this real clearly. It's always awkward <laughs> for pastors to talk about money. But basically, um, we have a little over $200,000 in savings for our church right now. Um, there's been a time in the not distant past where we were scrounging to, to make sure that people would get paid and that kind of stuff. We have relatively recently paid off, you have relatively recently paid off our church mortgage. We have no debt. <laughs> just a couple weeks ago, and this is just like, Jody had to have me sit down when she said it. <laughs> One weekly offering was $19,000. And we, to meet our budget, we need like a little over 6,000. And so honestly, this is me. <laughs> I feel a huge pressure about this. Not that people aren't giving, but to make sure that you hear clearly that we're appreciative of that, but also that we wanna use that money towards the mission. Because the goal of the church is not to be a country club that we give a bunch of money and then we have the nicest facilities for us to come hang out and hobnob with our friends. That's not the goal of the church. The goal of the church is not a business, you know, we're just gonna make a bunch of money and set it aside and just say, hey, we're really great. The goal of the church, as Jesus Christ very clearly said, is to make more and bigger apprentices of Jesus. And so the question I feel is on my shoulders or on our shoulders is like, how can we spend that money to do that? All right? And so uh, a couple years ago, I, asked that, I said the same thing, basically. And uh, out of that was birthed the soup ministry, which for like $6,000 a year or something and 20 people is impacting. You would not believe the amount of impact that that's having. And it's only been around for like a year. So if you have more ideas, please send them my way. Um, 
If you've been around here for a while, you probably know this spiel that I'm about to give right now, which is this. I say it all the time because I really think it's true. Church, the church going into the future cannot be simply a place that people show up and sit in a pew from 10 to 11 on a Sunday morning. I think the world is becoming not just uh, ambivalent towards Christianity, but almost um, anti-Christianity at such a rate that if we're going to be Christians going forward, we're going to have to actually go back to the New Testament early church and be a community of people that is having Jesus change our own lives and reaching out and loving those people who are lost without him. And so it's not a Sunday morning thing. It's a community of people going through life together to show off Jesus. That's what church should be. And so how are we going to go forward? Well, here's kind of the big announcement that I'm excited to share today. Um, there's a lot of other things in the works. There's, there's you know, the kids' family uh, nights. There's stuff we just talked about with the men's group. There's all sorts of things happening, which I'm real, real, real psyched about. But here's one of the ones that I just wanted to share publicly with everybody right now. Um, it's this. So starting today, we're sort of opening it up for a new uh, job position here on our staff. Um, talked with the elders, talked with the deacons, and what we want to do is we basically want to put our money and our resources um, and, and push in this direction that I, that I sort of tried to outline today. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to hire someone. Uh, the title for this job would be Director of connection and outreach. Director of connection and outreach. Here's kind of the vision. We, we want our church to be this community that I talked about. We want people to be in relationships with each other. And we also really, here's a question. If you never thought about this, I, I read this question like two months ago and it plagues my brain like almost every day. Here's the question. If our church ceased to exist, would the community around us be sad that we're not here? And I want that answer to be absolutely. Because I want them to be sad that Jesus' presence, right, wouldn't, would be missing. And so uh, this job position that we're opening up, let me talk about some of the details and then I'll, I'll sort of conclude with two thoughts. So, the idea is that this person isn't necessarily going to lead every single outreach we do. They're not going to lead, you know, 10,000 small groups, that kind of thing. The idea is that this person is going to deal with kind of the, the fine-tuned details, uh, manage, kind of promote, and make sure we execute all the things that we're trying to start around here. They're going to be kind of like a follow-up and encouragement and, and persuader to do the kinds of things that we want to do as a church. Um, I'm going to read that part up there if you, in case you can't read it uh, from where you're at. This is part of the job description, which I'm going to email out this week. Uh, there's also copies out here in the foyer. Um, so the ideal candidate for this position would be a self-motivated, task-oriented mobilizer of people. They'd be the kind of person who can take a vision or idea and fill in the details to turn it into reality. <clears throat> that includes things like communication, marketing, improvements, and scheduling. This person should be willing to take risks and experiment rather than waiting for instructions for every decision. A non-negotiable is that this person exhibits a passion to see the gospel grow in others and be spread into Mifflin County. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of questions, right? Like, is it a full-time job? Is it a part-time job? Can it be a guy or a girl? Like, like, there's a thousand, you know, are we looking for somebody older or somebody younger? There's a thousand questions, and I've thought through all of them for a long time. Please get our heart on this. We want the right person who's passionate about these kinds of things. And so we specifically did not set up at this point. Um, we did not set up, you know, it's this many hours, it's this pay, it's this age. None of that stuff is, is defined on purpose. Because my vision is, um, I think the Great Commission is compelling, and Jesus is compelling, to say we need to be about community, and we need to be about caring for our, the community that's around us here. And we want to make that happen. Let me say one last thing. 
Two last things, sorry. Uh, the first is this. I'm well aware of a lot of my weaknesses, uh, which there are plenty. <laughs> I, I just got them real good in the men's class, though, so you guys didn't see that. Um, I'm well aware of my weaknesses, of which there are plenty. One of them is I'm, I'm a big picture person. I'm a visionary. I'm like seeing this from 30,000 feet. I personally struggle with kind of the follow through and the details required to make sure things actually get on the ground and roll. And so if you hear me week after week, you hear me talking about the big picture, what I see, the vision for us. This job, the, one of the ideas of this job is to bring somebody in that can help to fill in those details, that can help to kind of on the organizational and detail side uh, respond to make those, those dreams not just be all talk and no action, but actually turn them into action. <clears throat> Here's the last thing I want to say. Uh, the Great Commission, the last line in the Great Commission uh, Jesus says, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There can be a feeling even after the sermon, right? You might be feeling this right now, like, I got to do more, Pastor Lily, even if you're excited. Like, I'm excited to do more, but I don't know what to do. Um, I don't have time. I'm busy. You know, I can't do that job, certainly, but I, I can't really do much because I'm so busy. These kinds of feelings. Here's the deal. Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He doesn't actually need our help. And that's a real big game changer. Because if you're guilted into doing something, if you feel like, I have to do this because, you know, Jesus needs me to do, he doesn't. He's there. He's here. He's in these people's lives. Like, he, he's available to anybody. All he's asking in this commission is, you get a chance to partner with me. Like, I'm going to give you the chance to join in on what's happening. And that's going to be, like, if you want to do that, it's going to be really fun. But you also don't have to carry the weight of that on your shoulders. And so whether you're, like, thinking about maybe, oh, maybe I'm interested in this job or something, please talk to us at whatever level you might have interest. Because we want a person who's excited about it. And we can work through all those details, right? But even if you're not at that place, if you're like, oh, I don't know what else I should do. Jesus is with you. Ask him, talk to him, get involved in something. Don't put the weight, like we don't have to manage, we don't have to manage the results. Our job is to throw seeds everywhere. And the Holy Spirit and God, they, like, God can do what he wants with that. <laughs> We're just chucking seeds. And so if you want to join in that kind of a thing, like there's not a lot of pressure in it, really. Um, and so if you are interested in the job, like I said, the description will be out there. Uh, email me, and we can, we can go from there, uh, have any conversation. Please know that regardless of what you do, if you're here, we love you, and I'm super thankful. Uh, it's an honor. It's an honor to be able to lead here. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that you would uh, continue to work uh, in our lives, in in. For anyone here who is a, an apprentice of Jesus, who has committed their life to him, who has, has been saved <laughs> through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, I pray that you'd help us to continue to see how awesome Jesus is and to really ask ourselves the question of, do we want to be more like him? And what are we doing to work towards that? If there's anybody here that's not, that says, I, I don't know if I am, I don't know, um, I pray that you, you would... Uh, work in their lives, that they would be drawn to the, the irresistible beauty and goodness and truth of Jesus Christ. I pray for us as a community that we could uh, throw seeds everywhere, that you would work in our hearts to bring us to um, unity, uh, but also excitement, passion about the mission that you have before us. I pray, Lord, that you would maybe inspire somebody who is <laughs> somebody who is particularly excited about all the stuff that I had to say earlier in this sermon, and they could think, I, I could never see myself working out of church or for church or whatever, like, that you might help them to see, whether they're old or young, a guy or a girl, whoever, to see um, how they could be part of, of that. And I pray for everybody here that we would all take some part of the mission. Everybody doesn't, doesn't have to do everything, but everybody can do something. 
And so I pray, Lord, for, for easy on-ramps uh, for folks into how to, like, if you're our Savior and our Lord, and you commissioned us to do these things, that we could try to do them. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.